Um, usually, I title my talks because I want to tell you what I'm going to talk to you about. But here, I want to kind of go on a bit of a journey with you that's not going to necessarily... I don't want to tell you where we're going. So as a result, there's no clear title. But the journey begins with one of my big frustrations with agile software development. I mean, the agile revolution has had a big impact, and it's been remarkable and very gratifying to see the impact it's had. It's had, but there have been frustrations, and there's one particularly big frustration that gets at me. Now, one of the benefits of Agile is in the days before Agile thinking, we had this notion that if you wanted to build software, you had to come up with everything you wanted done, put it together in some great document, and then sling it over and build software. And we know how well that worked. And it's very good that the Agile world now splits things up, breaks things down into independent little units of capability, often called stories, and then builds those stories one at a time. And by building the stories one at a time, we get a lot of benefits. We're able to get feedback as to where we are going, we're able to see our progress, and in particular, we're able to steer, we're able to change direction as we learn. And that's, of course, a vital part of what this whole thing is about. But there's still a problem here, and the problem is that arrow there. The notion that the stories are given from some kind of business analyst kind of role and are handed then to developers to code up. But the development team ends up being a passive recipient of stories. And I come across this a great deal in different places, both in ThoughtWorks and outside, where developers are basically see themselves as, we're an engine to turn some stories, maybe some rough tests, into actual code. We build whatever we're told to build. We don't really get involved in thinking about what it is we ought to be building. And this is very much against the idea that was at the heart of pretty much all of the Agile founders. If you get a bunch of people from Snowbird together and you say, you know, what do you think that you know, developers should be just building what they're told to build, they'll be horrified. Um, when we were coming up with names for Agile, um, Kent suggested, because at the time we, we didn't have the term Agile software. We needed to come up with a, what, what word we'd used. We ended up picking Agile, but one of the suggestions that Kent came up with was the word conversational, because he thought that the, the essence of this approach was these conversations between the development team and the business people about all aspects of software development, including what should be built. And the idea here is that developers and analysts should collaborate together to decide what stories should be built. Instead of analysts feeding stuff, or the business feeding stuff to developers, it should be this two-way thing. Um, a little example of this, I think, illustrates it quite nicely. There's a story, um, this is again a story from Amazon, where one of the developers thought it would be a really good idea to when people are working in the shopping cart, to put, you might like to buy so-and-so, you know, by analyzing what they've bought, by one analyzing all the data that they have, some suggested items that you might want to add. And the business person involved said, no, no, we don't want to do that because we don't want to distract people while they're shopping in the shopping cart, right? Because, you know, what is the most important thing for Americans? Shopping, exactly. So, you know, focus on the shopping cart. Now, this being Amazon, the developer said, no, I think he's wrong. And so he actually built a version of the shopping cart with the suggested things in there and ran A-B tests and was able to prove by looking at the numbers that it increased revenue. And being Amazon, the, you know, the business people said, well, you, know, you can't argue in the numbers, and so they carried on doing that. And that is that notion of, of collaboration. As software developers... We are familiar with the software world and what software can do, which means we can come up with ideas. There's no rule that says that all the stories need to be developed by the business. It is true, I think, that they should prioritize them, and they should have the final say in what gets built in what order, but the ideas that you come up with are often based on collaboration. I remember a story of uh, 
an early ThoughtWorks project where they were doing some stuff with a database and they did a little demo early on in the process and they were just showing, oh, we've got this information in the database. And they were showing the customer and the customer looked at the data and said, well, hang on, if you've got this data there, could you answer these questions for me? And, the, and they had a conversation and were, the developer was thinking SQL queries and the business person was thinking business process and they figured out, yes, they could do this. And he said, well, I never asked for this, but actually if we could build this, which seems to be trivial, um, that actually justifies the entire cost of the project right there. I never even thought of coming up with that requirement. Only in the conversation did it come together. And so conversational stories, the idea that we should work together and collaborate to come up with what we build, is a fundamental part, I think, of what Agile ought to be about. And that's, of course, the whole notion of things like monitoring and A-B tests. We begin to explore what should be built by actually watching what people do. That's, I think, a really big um, step forwards. But in order to do that, it's important that developers get a better knowledge of what the domain is about, because that knowledge is vital to being able to do this. And this is one of the areas where I think we've been a bit disappointing as a community, in that we haven't put enough effort into trying to know about the domain we work with. I remember talking to a, a friend of mine who was a project lead on a team doing some really interesting scientific work around genetic modeling, and he was very disappointed that most of the programmers on this team weren't interested in finding out more about the genetics. They weren't interested in the science. They just wanted to be told what was built. To be really effective as a software developer, I think you need to understand that domain. Get to find out how it clicks and how it works. Become knowledgeable in that domain. And then you can really influence what would be the most useful software to build in that domain. You're never going to know as much as the expert in that domain. When I worked in healthcare, you know, no one's going to ask me to become a doctor just because I've done some computer work in the area. But that knowledge that I did have was very valuable in collaborating over what to do in terms of the software. And in fact, when people come to me for career device advice and they say, you know, should I learn Scala or JavaScript or Clojure? Um, I say, well, it's less important about learning about languages. They come and go, and they're not really that different when it comes down to it. Learn the domain that you're working in. That is a very useful um, skill. And even if you end up moving to some completely different domain later on, the knowledge of how to learn domains and how to work with them is going to be something that's going to be really valuable for you. Now, as well as knowledge, I think that also brings in another thing, which is responsibility within that domain. And here, I want to bring up a topic of, that you might have heard of, something called dark patterns. Dark Patterns is a website that talks about it. It's really about how people use the user interface to encourage users to do things that are actually not in their best interest. Simple example of this. Um, imagine again, we've got the shopping cart. We're buying some electronics items, you know, a new camera or whatever. And the people who run the website say, oh, he's bought a new camera. What I'll, I know what I'll do. I'm going to put insurance for that new camera, I'm going to put it into the shopping cart automatically. The, the uh, user didn't ask for it. They weren't offered a little pop-up that says, do you want insurance? And somebody says, why would I buy insurance on something I can afford to replace? This is just a money spinner for the retailer, isn't it? No. No, what instead they do is they just pop it in the shopping cart anyway. Now, of course, I might notice that shop in item in the shopping cart and remove it, and that's perfectly OK. They make that possible. but they have put a thing in the shopping cart without asking me deliberately. Now that is manipulating a user to doing something that's not probably in their best interest. Similar thing is if you have something where, hey, sign up for free, and then they have this recurring $30 a month billing thing, and they make it really, really hard for you to cancel. You know, you've got this form and that form, and you know, half the time you hit the button, the submit button for the cancellation, you get a 500 error. Um, I mean, that is often bad, and sometimes it's done deliberately. Those things are dark patterns. And I think we as programmers have got to make explicit the act of rejecting this. We need to be advocates for our users. And my point here is that if you write code for that dark pattern, if you wrote the code that slips the 
um, insurance into the uh, shopping cart without the user asking for it. You are every bit as responsible as the person who asked you to do it. We are responsible for the software we write, both good and bad of what goes in there. Now, um, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, if somebody asks you to do something like that, you should automatically quit your job, otherwise you're a bad person. You know, I know you, everybody has to balance lots of things in their lives and all the rest of it, but you are responsible for the decision to write that code. And you have to balance that responsibility across everything else. Too many developers take the point of view is, it doesn't matter what I code, I just follow orders. Right? I just code what I'm asked to do. I don't think that is good enough. I think it is important that we as developers say, what we do is something that we're responsible for. We have to take that responsibility on. So dark patterns are, I think, an obvious case of where we have to think of ourselves differently and say we need to be advocates for our users. Um, but I think it even goes further than that. I mean, so far I've talked about a relatively small world of users and analysts and programmers developing software, coming up with things. But of course, that software and our users are making an impact upon the world. And we're also, in part degree at least, responsible for that impact. We have to say, what impact is our software having on the world around us? And that can affect Again, what we choose and where we choose to work. In my younger days, I spent a bunch of time working in healthcare. And then I had the, the chance uh, and did some consulting work in the City of London, in the financial industry. And I was quite keen to do that because the financial industry is quite interesting. Um, you know, these weird financial products are an intellectual, in, in, intellectually interesting thing to work at. Um, but having worked there for a while, I realized I didn't want to work in that kind of place because I didn't really feel that what they were doing was giving value to the world. You could tell it from the way they treated their customers. As far as they're concerned, their customers were you know, a little bit, little more than just people to be taken advantage of. You know, what thing can we sell them in order to get some commission for us? There was never any thinking in their heads as to is it actually going to be good for them. Very different to when I worked in the healthcare area, where the doctors and nurses that I talked to were very much concerned of what was in the patient's best interests all the time. So that led to a reaction for me that said, no, I don't think that I want to spend my talent supporting an industry and activity that I don't think is beneficial in the world. Now, we're in a privileged position in software development. Now, we have comfortable, we can fairly easily get comfortable jobs you know, without any danger involved. We're not going down mines or packing meat or anything like that. We're not likely to be, um, do physical harm to ourselves other than maybe a little bit of RSI, um, which is actually not something to trivialize, but it's a hell of a lot better than chopping your arm off. I mean, that's what happens in a lot of meat packing areas, particularly in the States. Um, you know, we get well paid for what we do. Um, and I think we have a certain degree of responsibility to say, where are we going to apply our talents? Because in the end, we are responsible for using our talents to hopefully make the world somewhat of a better place. Now, I'm not necessarily saying everybody should stop what they're doing and go and build hospitals in India or something of that kind. But we should say, is what we're doing useful? I gave a variant on this talk once, and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I was very taken with what you were saying, but you know, I'm not doing sort of any particularly socially useful work. I just built write printer software. And before I could even answer, the guy behind him said, yes, but printer software is useful. Now, I've just had to uh, buy a house. It was really useful for me to be able to print out all the forms for that house on my printer. That saved me a lot of trouble. It made the whole process a lot easier. You know, something as humble as printer software is valuable stuff. Right? It's, a, it's a useful thing that makes people's lives better. On the other hand, if you're writing the software that says, I'm going to say that we've run out of ink when we've still got a quarter ink left, um, that's a dark pattern, by the way, then that would be a bad thing. But the point is, you have to say, you don't have to be um, contributing to a charitable cause or something like that to be making the world a better place. But I think it is important for everybody to reflect on you know, how is the software I'm writing having an effect on the world? 
Is it good or is it not? And, and we all make individual decisions about what things we would support and what things we shouldn't. But what is common across all of us is that we have the responsibility and we, fought, we take the responsibility for that choice that we make overall in our careers. And then the last area that I want to talk to as I bring up this responsibility theme is the very big picture. What impact is all of our software and our programming and our profession having upon the world in aggregate? And there are two areas where I'm really concerned about this and where I think we as a profession need to work much, much harder to improve things. The first of these is the alienating atmosphere that exists that pushes many people away both from our profession and from using software. Um, the most obvious example of this is the fact that all you've got to do is look around this room and say to yourself, hmm, there aren't many women here, are there? That is not a good sign. I mean, we, when I got into the software industry, one of the things that appealed to me about the software industry was the notion that it was a meritocratic world, right? It didn't matter the fact that I come from a working class family in an industrial area of, the, of Britain, you know, and I wasn't, you know, I, I had a fairly good education, but, you know, I wasn't brought up with the refinements that, you know, somebody more upper class would have. What mattered is, can I produce good code? You know, that meritocratic quality is a nice thing, and it would be a good thing to see more broadly in the world, and less um, emphasis on inherited wealth and class and status, and more emphasis on... Uh, what kind of good work you can do. But any statement that the software industry is a meritoc meritocracy is rather undermined when 50% of the population is so severely underrepresented. On top of that, that means that there's a lot of really good talent that we're not getting into our profession, which is a terrible waste, both for our profession and especially for the people who otherwise would have had a good, um, have been able to take part in, our, in what we do. And it's particularly compounded by the fact that a lot of the people that are pushed away from our industry are people in groups that have suffered hundreds of years of discrimination. And that's true for women, it's true for African Americans in, in the United States, it's true for lower caste um, people in India. It varies depending on where you are in the world as to what groups tend to be pushed away, but it's common. And we have to fight against that. I mean, you can't not look at uh, what goes on in the web at the moment without seeing many cases uh, of where groups are pushed away and alienated, and we have to fight against it. And it's something we all are responsible for doing. The fact that we ourselves individually might not be acting like jerks doesn't mean that we can just ignore the problem. Um, there's a phrase um, that an Australian general um, made famous through, his, uh, through a YouTube video, says the, the behavior you walk past is the behavior you accept. And I think that is very true. If we allow people to be thugs on the internet and push away um, various groups, we're in the end complicit. So we have to figure out how to stop that. And that's not just within the professional world and actions, it's also in our software. Um, one of the big problems that people face is harassment, for instance, on Twitter. And it troubles me that the engineers and the data scientists at Twitter haven't found ways to try and reduce that harassment. I mean, we can come up with all sorts of clever ways of targeting advertising. Why can't we use at least some of that brain power to figure out ways of, of preventing online harassment? We should do that. So that's my first issue we need to do something about the alienating atmosphere around our industry. The second issue is privacy on the internet and the fact that we need to act to ensure that we have a free internet where we people can collaborate without fear of um, persecution by governments or attacks by criminal groups, etc., etc. I'm not going to say much more about that now because there's a whole talk that I'm going to give with Eric um, later on in the Defending the Free Internet section. And uh, please come along to that if you want to hear us go in a lot more detail about why privacy is important to all of us, whether we think we have nothing to hide or not, and what we can do about to fix it. So let's come back to this question. What's the title of this presentation? How do I sum all this up? Well, basically, I've been saying in this last 20 minutes is that we don't want 
we don't think that we as developers should be just code monkeys bashing out code. We should be a profession, just as doctors are a profession or lawyers are a profession. And we should look for that kind of, of status in what we do. And we should also take on the responsibilities that that status implies. That means we must engage with the world, reject this stereotype of software developers being people who live in basements and are just fed pizza under the door every so often, and say, no, we can engage with the world. We can help um, steer the world in a better direction. I mean, our software does that anyway, but often does it without the developers playing an active role in that. I think the developers should play an active role in that. We are bright people. We are well-educated, hopefully have a sensible view of the way the world should be, and potentially can act as leaders as to how um, the world can be run better. But in order to do that, we need to take the responsibility to step up and do that. And my request to you all is to think about ways in which you can do that, small or large, individual or combined with others, but taking that responsibility and acting as leaders in the world. Thank you. Thank you.